Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Khalid McCaskill. I'm a first year MBA at MIT Sloan. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel, Leveling Up, How Basketball Teams Deploy Analytics to Develop Players. Our panelists today, Shane Battier, former Vice President of Analytics and Development for the Miami Heat. Dr. Catherine Evans, Vice President of Research and Information Systems at Monumental Sports and Entertainment. Mike Zarin, Vice President of Basketball Operations and Team Counsel for the Boston Celtics. And our panel will be moderated by Ben Cohen from the Wall Street Journal. The panel will run for 45 minutes, and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag Basketball Analytics. Uh, your questions will then be selected by the moderator. And with that, Ben, I turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I know it's early on a Saturday morning, so I just want to clear up any confusion. We do have Shane Battier in this room. But we are not in the Shane Battier room. That's next door. Although I think Shane might like, you have to check out a few minutes early to go watch the golf panel yes. before we're done. I think yes. that's where you'd rather be, right? Yes, that's, that's where my heart is. Yeah. Um, so let's go back in time a little bit to 2007, which is the first year of this conference in the classroom on MIT's campus. Mike Zarin, you were on this very basketball analytics panel because you've been on every single one ever since. I'm not sure that that's a good thing. <laughs> Kathy? a bunch of guest chairs up to the front of the room. There were like eight other people in the room wondered which of us were speaking on the panel. It wasn't like this. Look no where you lights. are now. Kathy, you, um, you have a master's and a PhD in biostatistics. In 2007, you were an undergrad stats major at Harvard. Yes. Did you come to the conference? Not as an undergrad. Okay. Not until I was doing my PhD. <laughs> and Shane, you were in your sixth NBA season, your first with the Houston Rockets. Mike, you were trying to trade from him when you were, mm -hmm. when you were with the Celtics. I got really angry at Daryl. He left the Celtics and got the trade done and I was and to Houston. And I was like, I'm trying to get Shane. <laughs> but that's where I want to start because um, I really want to frame this conversation around all of the fascinating issues in player development right now. Shane, you are the only one of us who has played in the NBA, believe it or not. And um, you know, so you've, you've played, you've been an executive, you've had access to all of the advanced statistics and the crazy analytics that we have now and the hardcore data and every sophisticated system that players and teams are using. So I'm curious, what would you be doing today to develop that you did not do and could not do in 2007? Oh, Lord. Um, my mentor was the great, is the great Chip England, taught me how to shoot. And I tell him now, I saw him a month ago, I said, if we go back in time, I would try to shoot 15 threes a game. And that's it. I wouldn't have stepped inside the three-point line. And I, I think about all the time I wasted doing things like, like step-back jumpers and trying to split pick and rolls, things I never did as a player, uh, knowing what I, what I know now. And uh, look, in basketball now, um, there, there are three numbers that, that really matter. And you guys are, are free to disagree with this. But it's, you know, can you make an open shot? All right, a no-dribble jump shot. Well, two or, from two or from three, all right? How well do you finish, all right, once you get in the paint? Dunk, layup, I don't care. And how often do you foul, draw fouls, okay? If you do all those three things, do them well, all right, you're a Hall of Famer, all right? Most all-stars do two of those three things at, a, at an elite level. And as an NBA player, you're probably doing one of those things above, uh, above, above average. Um, is that fair? fair Every case? so often, you should probably play defense. Too. Well, yeah. you know, it's over. It's Shane overrated. doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so, you know, thinking back on, on how I developed as a player, um, we, didn't, we didn't have the information, right? And you look at the, the development coaches now, which is now a, a cottage industry, which didn't exist when I was, you know, in the league 20 years ago. Um, I think coaches understand that. Um, players, if you look at shot charts, much different than 20 years ago. And so it bears out. The, da the data is bearing, bearing out, but I was telling these guys last night, it's kind of like uh, telling your kids to e eat vegetables, okay? Kids know that vegetables are good for them. They don't know why they're good for them, all right? Players today, they know that rim shots are good. They don't know why they're good for them, all right? And, and so the evolution of player development is, is bearing out in, in the numbers. I don't think players understand you know, how the sausage is made, so to speak. 
Do you think you, you would have been a different player? Would you have been a better player? Um, I, would have been, uh, I would have made more money if my parents would have waited to have me about 10 years. That's my biggest gripe. <laughs> um, I think I would have been a better player because I would have focused, uh, you know, I would have taken a lot more threes. Um, and I would have worked on my finishing a lot more than I, than I did, two most important skills. I, I was never a big foul drawer, so that was not never my game. Uh, but I would have been a better finisher and a better three-point shooter because I really would have focused on those things. Hmm. Kathy, I, I heard you say recently that when people ask what you do, you say that you use data and statistics to try to win games, which I love. It's a very like, simple and useful definition. I assume that like, by the same definition, um, if we think of like player development, it's like using data and statistics to try and get better, right, at basketball. And so, you know, talking about three-point shooting and Shane taking 15 three-pointers a game in today's NBA, if, if you're looking at players, if you want to evaluate a three-point shooter, this might sound silly, but like, is, is three-point shooting percentage in a game the best metric to do it? So I think this is like, it's kind of an interesting question, which is what am I, what am I actually trying to measure, right? Which is, is three-point shooting the best measure of how well this player has shot in games from three? Yes, it is, it is the best measure. Like, if that's the question that you have. If your question is, how well do we think he's going to continue to shoot from three for the rest of this season? How well do we think he's going to shoot from three next season, two seasons from now? That's a different kind of question that is more predictive, it is not descriptive. Um, and if it is just like, who is a, the best shooter? Yeah, who is a good shooter? I mean, but even, even that is, is lacking context. Is it, are they, is it just like, are they open in the corner, wide open, and they have a full second to take the shot, and they're not going to be contested? Is it pulling up off the bounce, heavily contested by a great defender? All of these things are really important. If you just look at their three-point shooting percentage, I mean, it tells you something. Again, it tells you what they have done in game. Um, but in terms of evaluating their actual shooting ability, we're gonna look at what was the quality of the shot um, in the game based off of what we have from the spatial tracking data. We don't have pose data, but that should be coming soon. It's coming. Um, and so that will give you a better sense of how contested that shot was. Um, we also will have the uh, you know, shooting data from in the gym. We'll understand like how well do they shoot on catch and shoots in the gym, how well do they shoot when they're sort of contested, although the contest level in the gym is gonna be very different than it is in the game, so you have to account for that. Um, there's also a question of like, what was the scheme? What were we trying to have them do? Was this three-point shot the result of the play that was drawn up? Is this what we were trying to do for this player? How are we using him? Has that changed over time? If his three-point percentage has gone down, is it because he used to just be open in the corner and now he's having to create his own shot? And like, let's account for that. That's like 23 questions. Yeah. <laughs> I should have asked all 23 of them. Um, but, you know, even, hard. Even, even with all that context, like, make miss, is that too noisy? Are you looking at arc and depth and left-right coordinates? I mean, is that a, is that, does that tell you more about the quality of a shot than just if it went in or not? So, yeah. So, in, like, in theory, there's a, like, perfect shot, which is, like, at 45 degrees and, like, 10 inches back and right in the middle of the hoop. Um, and they call it like, that splash zone. But even then, for different players, they might have a sort of different splash zone. A really um, good example of this is in the WNBA. Um, two seasons ago, we had Elena Deladon and Tina Charles, both of whom shoot very, 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 very well. Their shots look completely different from each other. Hmm. And so if you just gave me their shots sort of like um, without understanding the context, without understanding who was shooting it, I might look at um, one of those players' shots and say, ah, this, this looks really bad. Um, but once I know who's doing it, it tells me a lot more. Yeah, we were one of the first teams to put the cameras in, and Ray Allen's shot was like the flattest on our team. Yeah. We weren't trying to tell people to shoot like Ray, even though we sort of wanted them to shoot like Ray. <laughs> yeah. It's complicated, but um, uh, as we get even more data starting next year, I think we're gonna have 19 points on each player at like 50 hertz in NBA games, which is a lot more data even than we have now. Um, you know, we'll, we'll know more, but you got to actually go through all those steps to answer all those questions. You know, what, and, and the old adage, good passes make good shots. Yeah. Still true. You know, exactly. that's like a whole, another variable we don't even talk about. Like, I used to, like, I used to cuss out LeBron James 
Like, I'm probably the only person to ever cuss him out because he would go in the lane and do something crazy, and when he knew he was about to get his, his shot blocked, he'd throw the ball, but he'd throw the ball at me and my ankles. And I, the shot clock's running down. I have to catch the ball from here and try to make a three-pointer. And I said, LeBron, if you want a triple-double, hit me in the chest. All right, I didn't say it that nicely. And he wrote, my bad, my bad, bad Batman. But uh, that's a variable that, like, makes a huge difference in your ability to make three-point shots. Where is the pass? Is it on time, on target, in rhythm, or is it messed up at your, at your ankles? I think a lot of people in Boston have cussed out LeBron James. Well, <laughs> fair enough. He's cussed us out plenty, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mike, you mentioned like, the information coming next year. Like, can you explain what is it and how is it going to change things? Um, so, I mean, the, the NBA has announced this publicly some. There's a deal with uh, a different camera provider, Hawkeye, who, who does some stuff in... Um, other sports. Tennis. Tennis, uh, most famously. The, the little animations that show you if the ball hit the line or not, that's from a Hawkeye system. Um, and uh, the new system is going to not, right, right now we're getting the center of the player's mass 30 times a second on the ball um, for the games. And the new system is going to have slightly more frequent slices of data and also 19 points on the body. Um, so we'll have people's pose, and it, it'll make a big difference, particularly in um, early, it will make a big difference in figuring out if a shot is contested well or not. Um, team's shot models will just get much better because it's obviously very different if you're shooting, if your hands are like this, if the defender's like this versus if the defender's like this. So um, I don't know that that'll make so much difference in sh for shots around the rim because mostly guys have their hands up around the rim anyway. But. The contest level matters so much closer Contem to the contest rim level than matters it does a ton. the further out you move. Yeah, so. no doubt. Yeah. So um, we'll see. You know, there's going to be 80 other things that we can do with this data. Um, a lot more interesting injury stuff, uh, although we'll have to see how good the accuracy of the 19 points are. But um, I think, you know, w we measure so many things um, for the first, I don't know, 12, 15 years of this all we could talk about is how we wanted more data. It's definitely getting to the point now where it's like, all right, what are you doing with the data? We've got lots and lots and lots of data. Well, it's funny. There was a time, like maybe around 2007, when the Celtics probably did have more information than most teams. Like you could have a data advantage, and now it seems like it's what you are doing with it. Is that, does, does that sound right to you? Yeah, for NBA data, yeah, that's true. For, for other leagues, I don't know, maybe... Kathy might know more about some other leagues, but for NBA data, we've, I mean, you have your own team's practice data. That's very different from team to team. Uh, but for, in terms of what happens in game, yeah, the, the teams are sharing all the data. The, the second year we had the cameras in, there were five teams, and it was us and four Western Conference teams, and one of them said to us, because I just wanted to share, you know, the more games you have, the better, right? And uh, this one team who has a relatively uh, famous owner, um, said, we'll share with you, Boston, but not the other Western Conference teams. <laughs> like, okay. But, but uh, yeah, I think for, I don't know, maybe you feel differently, Kathy, but the, the data we have for NBA games is pretty similar across all teams. Yeah, I would, I would agree for in-game. It's a question of, like, do you have an engineering team that can ingest it all? Can you get it all in a, like a, a, at the speed that's necessary? Um, that's, that's, I think, where the competitive advantage is going to come in, like, the short term, and then eventually every team will have it we'll have the engineers that can do that, and then it'll be the next step, and the next step, and the next step, and you always try to stay ahead of, like, I always say, like, I don't need to be the best team at this. We just need to be, like, in the top 10, and really, like, the top in the Eastern Conference, like, if the Western Conference teams are doing really well, like, that's fine. Well, Kathy, if you, if you suddenly had the resources of a baseball team, and there's no salary cap for <laughs> building, like, your staff, what would your ideal analytics staff be? Like, how many people, what are they doing? I assume that, like, 200 people is too, too many, and two people is too few. So like, yes. where, where would you land? Oh, God. Um, so I guess like starting with like the data level, you need like at least one, probably two, and if I have like 30 people, numerous data engineers, your job is just making sure all of the data is coming in properly, on time, clean. Um, on top of that, you want to have like your full stack software engineers who are, you know, got to have a dedicated DevOps person. Um, anyway, like the full, full software engineer, in, engineering team completely separate from your like research team. So I would think of it as like research and development. Um, so you want front end engineers, I'd want at least like one or two, somebody with a design background so that the, the images that you're putting out, the reports all look really nice for the end users so it's not just a bunch of spreadsheets. Um, I'd want a couple of PhD level machine learning 
PhD level statisticians, uh, and that I'd want, I don't know, two to three uh, former players who have decided that they're interested in, in the analytic space and statistics, who know how to write like a little bit of SQL code, a little bit of Python, um, because I don't, I, I don't, I'm like, I, I'm not Shane. I've never played basketball. I don't know what it's like to be down there. I don't know what's actually like important, what's going through people's heads. And so like, I, I think it's really key to have people who have played the game at a high professional level be in that room. So you were looking for former NBA players who are fluent in SQL and Python and R. I'm looking for the John Urschel of the NBA is okay. really what I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay. Mike, does, that, does, that, does the shape of that staff sound right to you? Um, yeah, most, I mean, I, I, I don't, if there's like one constant on this panel, it's that every year we say the communication is at least as important as the insights. And so uh, I don't know that they need to be former NBA players, but uh, you yeah. need to have a set of people who um, can interact with non, non statistics. I mean, right, I, I said this once before like the Venn diagram of people who know statistics, know basketball, and can communicate at all. Like, it's, there's not a lot of overlap in those three. Um, zones and so uh, that that's the hardest piece actually um, it's not hard to find these days it isn't you might have to you know spend more because Google and Netflix and all these companies are hiring, uh, hiring all the best data players out of Caltech like that was my, but, was my dream but, uh, I these there are lots of people in tech looking for jobs right now that, that's mm -hmm. that may be true the, I mean the problem is even the team the size Kathy describes which no NBA team has right now um, that times 30 is not that many people. And so there's a lot of people in this room, and some of you want jobs. Um, it's not a huge marketplace. Uh, and so that's, that's the difficult part for, for people looking to get into this is most NBA teams have way, way, way fewer people than the set of people Kathy just described. Uh, and it, it will continue to get bigger, and the more data we get, the more people we'll need. But it's not an enormous industry. So before we get back to like the, Twitter's fired more people than the NBA employs in total doing data science across all the teams in the league. I mean, probably and, by a factor of like, a lot. You know, and a Mike, billion, to, right? to, to that to that point, number one thing I tell uh, young people who are, who want to break in, you have to mix in a behavioral psychology class. <laughs> it's super important. How, how do you distinguish yourself? There there are brilliant statisticians in this room. There are brilliant programmers, engineers in this room. All right, do you have a high EQ, all right? The soft skills, that's how you differentiate yourself, all right? And so mix in a behavioral psychology course, it will pay off dividends when you're competing with each other for the jobs we're talking about. Well, it's funny. Kathy's like the data engineer who's receiving the, doing the mapping of you know, I'm not which a Marcus engineer. Williams is it. No, I'm just saying, okay. Kathy's, that person, that person, she's not, she's not concerned about that person's EQ, I don't think. Maybe. I mean, if you're going to spend a lot of time with somebody on your team, yeah, you're still going to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So before we, um, I, I want to get back to development, but just like on a brief detour on the behavioral front. Shane, how did you like communicate to LeBron the importance of analytics? You did not like show him spreadsheets. What did you do the <laughs> no. first time? I got lucky. Uh, I was able to get credibility with LeBron. We're playing uh, uh, KD, and KD has like pretty like, at the time, he may, it may be different now, but he had significant splits when he shot over his left shoulder in the post versus his right shoulder in the post. So we're playing him, and I went to LeBron before the game. LeBron knew I was pretty, you know, pretty, pretty studious with, my, with my, my study before the game and my scouting reports. And I said, yo, LeBron, like, if you switch on KD, just make him go over his left shoulder. He wants to go over his right shoulder. He's much, much better. It's like 200 bips better over his right shoulder than his left shoulder. And by the grace of God, you know, LeBron got switched off on Durant like twice, and both times he went over his left shoulder, and he missed both shots. And after the game, he goes, damn, Batman, that was great. What else you got? <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him, you know, about variance, about sample size, about normal distribution, you know, minor details. I'm like, Bron, I got you, baby. <laughs> so every game I was able to tell him, we're playing, you know, Carmelo, we're playing Ginobili, we're playing these guys. Hey, hey, just, just force this guy left. You know, tr just trust me. And so... Um, again, LeBron didn't care how we got to, the, got to those numbers. He, know, he knew it worked, so I'm going to keep doing it. And if you show players that there is an advantage to be gained, and that's what we're talking about, using data to win games, all right? They don't care 
how we got to that, that point. They just want to know, oh, I can be better. I can gain an advantage against my competition. OK, cool, bet. And so that's how I taught the greatest player of all time, just a little something. But, for, but this, the first is, time but this is a good point. Like, the, the sound of the messages to the players haven't changed over yeah. this time. Maybe there's a little bit of the scouting reports you give someone before the playoffs might look a little different. Yeah. But for the most part, it's still the same language. We're, we're just more, you know, we're just right more often yeah. I think, now. The players don't have any idea that you've switched from using some sort of logit to using a neural net to come up with the answer to this question, right? Like, they just know you're forcing them left. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's the first time 200 bips has been used in a pregame <laughs> scouting report. I'm curious, Mike, on, like on that front, which player um, I don't want to get you in trouble. So on the Celtic has, has used like information, data, statistics available to him most effectively. Like, can you think of players who have used this type of data to help their own development? You, you know, what's funny. Like, um, I don't, we've, some players have been more interested in this stuff than others, um, getting it sort of directly. Uh, I, I think a lot about, uh, Brian Scalabrini was always asking for more, more information. I'm not sure he actually used any of it. He just wanted to quote the parts that said he was good. <laughs> um, I'm not sure he actually used any of it to get better. We, we've had a lot of guys come through who um, want access. You know, there's this platform synergy that has a lot of tags and, and attached video to it. And uh, we've had a lot of guys want synergy accounts, and they'll come ask questions about, all right, you know, is this meaningful or not? Do you give it to them, them if they ask for we it? We have. We have, yeah. Um, and, you know, it varies widely how much guys care. We're always worried, right? Like, there's so many things that have really small sample sizes uh, that, like, you know, that will convince players that they should do something that they probably shouldn't do. But, you know, they made all three shots they did, they, you know, that they had taken when doing something that's generally not efficient. And so uh, it's a little scary every time we give a player a synergy account because you don't know what they're going to sort of glean from it. Um, the good news and bad news about those situations, the good news obviously is someone wants to get a lot better. The bad news is oftentimes the, the, the team goals will be slightly different you know, from what a player might think when looking at that set of data. Yep. And in general, we want sort of one message to come from our whole group, the coaching staff, you know, the front office, everybody else. We try to get on the same page about what we're trying to get every player to do. So um, in large part, we leave that communication to the players' coaches so that we don't send a bunch of mixed messages. Because the worst thing that we can have is one set of people in our organization or some tool we give the players, giving the players one message and the coaching staff giving them a different message. That's a real danger. So um, you know, we're sort of a little bit more careful about what we give guys. But, but uh, there's a lot of players. It's amazing now how many guys, like points per possession is not an alien concept to the vast majority of players we have now. Mm -hmm. When you were playing, that was like a totally alien thing for our players. So uh, not weird to quote how good an offense is. By efficiency you know, and not points. By, by you know, one point, whatever, points right. per possession. All the players are used to hearing that now. And, it, and, and that's a little bit different set of communication than has happened in the past. What about you, Kathy? Have you found players who like, are interested in this data or like, have actually used it to help their development, to get better at their jobs? Yes, I'm, I'm reluctant to name players by name. But there definitely are players who, especially like the cameras that we have in the gym, yeah. will really engage with understanding what their shot looks like. In um, what sense? How? Um, just like sort of like so there's there's like vocal feedback that can happen live when they shoot it and they'll tell them whether they're short or long or exactly where they are and so like in the moment they'll get that immediate feedback of what things look like. Um, and I would say in general the younger players get a lot more excited about understanding things. I think to some extent player development is understanding what players are good at, what their skills are and putting them into situations that allow them to thrive in that situation. And I think with, with younger players, they are trying to um, you know, hone those particular skills and, and stand out so they can get their next contract. So they are still developing. But younger players now, especially like in the NBA, like they are part of this money ball generation where like this, the idea of using data and statistics is not, they didn't have to change their minds about that, right? Like that in some ways is the way they think about sports. Is, does that factor into it as well, do you think? I mean, you'd have to ask them. <laughs> like, You're like, around them. I mean, but all of you guys are around. Like, is, has there been a generational shift in the way that players are willing to use data to help them get better? I think the one, the, it, so yes, but, right? The, the, 
this stuff just doesn't sound alien. There isn't a resistance to hearing about numbers. That they're yeah, using. it's not. It's not that they're more willing to do it. It's just it's become more ubiquitous. It's like these these pieces of information are just now a part of the information that they're getting. I'm sure that the players wouldn't think that like oh we're this new generation that uses analytics. It's just the information that they're getting includes it, and. Like, it, it's just commonplace. Ten years ago, trying to get someone to wear something during practice that tracked them was difficult with a lot of players. Now everyone's wearing it in college, and they show up, and it's weird if they're not wearing it. I, I would say, like, I was actually a high school coach this year. I coached my son. I was a freshman. Uh, Don, Don what was your record? Uh, we weren't great. We weren't great. We were, we were 9 and 15. So we, we struggle with uh, size, talent, and athleticism. Coaching? But, uh, and coaching. <laughs> yeah. And coaching. Uh, but we're, it was a building year. It was a building year. Um, no, we, we had great, great kids who, who worked really hard. We, we had a tough schedule. Um, but like Huddle, Blame is, the it, Huddle is, is the platform every, uh, every young player plays on. You know, and they're building their mixtapes. And, and Huddle actually has uh, a pretty advanced for, for high school. I would have like, you know, given anything to have this data when I was in high school. And so you can generate shot charts and heat maps and you can dice the data in so many different ways just off of Huddle. And I think Huddle's doing an amazing job of, of, of propagating data. So we can go into a, a meeting and say, hey guys, you know, we were only, you know, when we ran half court offense, we were 0.8 points per possession and, and you don't have to explain it, they, they get it. And so I do think the, you know, thanks to software and, and AAU and the EYB, EYBL and, and the leagues, um, way more advanced, and so the, the players have a much higher baseline they're starting from. Yeah. Um, this is for all three of you. I, I, I think Bill Simmons a few years ago was the first to report that Shane, your old teammate LeBron, spends like millions of dollars a year on his own body. And I'm curious if any of you think that like any player will ever get to the point, maybe not millions of dollars, but like significant amount of their own money on their personal data and statistics and analytics. Maybe not this, you know, obviously like the leagues and teams are providing better information they can get on their own, but like doing personalized stats. Is, is there a future in that, do you think? Well, the one story I have, and it's apocryphal, and you know, my favorite player to play against was Kobe. And uh, we, we were frenemies, and I never spoke to Kobe outside the gym, ever, not one sentence. Uh, and we, put, we had this like love-hate thing going on in the court where he was icy one day and then we were buddies the next day. It was this cat and mouse game. And after uh, the Lewis article came out, the Nostat All-Star, um, pissed Kobe off. Because essentially, you know, painted, painted this, 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 you know, this guy who's unathletic and slow actually has a chance against, you know, one of the greatest players of all time. And so the story I heard, and, and I'll never be able to verify this, is that after that article, Kobe hired a coach to watch every one of our possessions and figure out if I was doing anything special to slow him down. Because Kobe didn't believe it. Like, no way, no, bad, no bad EA can't, can't guard me. And so he was hiring someone to produce counter analytics against my analytics, which I love the story and knowing the way Kobe was, it's not out of the question. Uh, but that's like, you re you're really, really looking at it for every edge. And I don't know if players are willing to go that far. They're not, I mean, I think of basketball players as like ruthless competitors who are always looking for an edge. There's only so many hours in the day. I got to text Mike Procopio, I'm sure it was. <laughs> yeah. We'll see, I'll find yeah. out. Look, like, there's only so many hours in the day, right? And so we talk about like messaging to players. <laughs> a, a coaching staff only has X amount of messages to their players before they tune out. You know, that's like all of us. We can only absorb so much information until like, I'm, I'm done working today, I, I can't no more. All right, basketball players are no different. So what are the most important messages that we can tell our players to maximize their potential, right? I think the answer to your question is it's gonna happen in high school and college. And then those players will come up Those to players the will come up and they'll ask us for the data that they're used to getting from, you know, their dad installed the second spectrum tracking system in their high school gym because it's some really wealthy school. Um, and then they're going to say, oh, we already got this stuff in high school. Can we get it for, for the NBA? Um, it's much more likely to happen there. We, we've invested, our league has invested so much in data gathering that I don't, I don't, you know, players may spend some on individual weight training or nutrition stuff, but we do a lot of that stuff in our facility, too, that we track also. We, you know, we just, New Balance just helped us build this great new facility in Brighton, and we've got, it's on the, fifth floor of a vibration dampened building and we've got force plates in the floor 
And to do that, you can't have vibration dampening under a force plate. So you, we, those, the force plates are actually separately supported five floors down to the ground. We put a lot of money into this stuff. Um, and it would surprise me if a player is going to think they can get better data on all the stuff they're doing at our facility better than they can get it from us. Hmm. So it would surprise me if a player wanted to invest in those things at that level. But it, won't shock, it wouldn't shock anyone in this room, probably, to find that there are some wealthy parents who would want to do that uh, for kids at a younger level. I can see it like contract negotiation time to like really highlight the things that they've been doing particularly yeah. well. Um, I would assume that happens already, right? Mike? Sure, of course. Right. Yeah, you get the packet from the agent when you're going right. to negotiate a deal saying, here are all the things my client does well. You just don't have the high schoolers spending a lot of money. Like Those players haven't trickled up into the NBA yet. I think, yeah, I, I do think that's coming to some extent. I don't know how much, but um, the, you know, this stuff's still not cheap to do. Yeah. The, the cheapest thing to do is like there's home court app, right, where you can you know, make a shot chart from any basketball court anywhere in the world by just setting up an, uh, um, an iPhone on a tripod. But... Um, there's, there's like a whole array of tech coming that's going to democratize this more. But I, I don't, NBA players are going to get it from us, I think, just because we have it. Yeah. More of it and better yeah. data. Yeah. Kathy, you know, baseball has a facility like Driveline mm -hmm. where players are experimenting with biomechanics and tweaking how they grip the ball and studying their own data. Is, is there an equivalent kind of lab in basketball? Will there be? Should there be? There, there certainly some are some that that like exist, and you put on the like motion capture suits, and then you can get a full sense of that. And as the cameras come in, and we get that already. But the thing with driveline is, as I understand it, and I have my knowledge of baseball is not as good as people who actually work on teams, is that it's about pitching mechanics, right? So it's about the like very precise pitching mechanics. And with that, that is a like purely physical thing, right? And the pitcher is set. He knows what pitch he's throwing and where he's going to throw it. And so there's no sort of like decision-making process that happens once, he's, once he starts his throw. In basketball, like there's a lot more decision-making stuff that happens on the fly. I would say like free throw shooting, it's like purely mechanical. Maybe if you're wide open and you have like a, a solid amount of time to like set, think about it, check your phone, and then take the shot. Um, but for everything else, like there's there's a lot more that that goes on than I think that what Driveline is trying to capture. Um, I know that they're getting into hitting stuff, and you know they're they're now getting like bat positioning and, and all of that. And so like yes, I would say like some version of that. But I think the Driveline version of it, that like very 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 precise mechanical thing. I'm going to be proven wrong, but I think that it's like most applicable in free throw shooting. There are some facilities doing biomechanical stuff. Yeah. Right. So like, you know, P3, what are your yeah. jump mechanics? Yeah. P3 is probably the most famous of those. Um, but, you know, I think we're going to get the pose data from the games and be able to do a lot of that stuff uh, with game data. Um, but, but Kathy's right, it's just so much more complicated. We don't have such an isolated moment as yeah. a pitch or a swing um, in our game. There's just more moving parts. Like even 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 hitting, where there is some decision that's being made, and there's maybe adjustments that are happening once you've already made that decision. Like it's still this really isolated event of the pit, like the hitter by himself. There isn't anybody else trying to get in his business. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of thinking of like shooting mechanics, which very widely, like you would think that every <laughs> basketball player on earth would try to shoot like Steph Curry, right? But they don't, and there's like yeah. I'm but it's this thing of like, okay, so again, in, in free throw shooting, that is a fixed motion. And you're going to do the same thing every time. Even if, you, even if you're working on like a, a three-point shot, and even if it's a pull-up three-point shot, like, I don't know, the, everything that's going to happen in a game is a lot harder to replicate in a practice facility. And so I, I just like that, that next step to you're not like you're, there's somebody there, there's somebody in the corner, there's like you're paying attention to everything that's all around you, and maybe you can replicate that really, really, really well in a facility, but like how we, how we intention you know, drills should be, should be aiming towards what it's going to be like in a game, and I think that's just a lot harder to replicate in basketball than it is in baseball. I'm going to push back on both of these things a little bit, though, and say uh, it's coming with computer vision on your phone. There's already people doing some of this stuff for all sorts of exercises and games, where they can, you can easily get pose data on an iPhone, and you'll be able to do that with your shot at home. But, but, but like, I, 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 I don't I, disagree. I agree. It'll be, it's, it's just that like, like, to, to do it many, many, game. many, many, many times, to have a contested shot many, 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 many times in a game-like setting is very hard to replicate unless it is all of your contested shots over the course of a season. I totally agree, but practice shots can help you with those shots, even if they're not the same. I, I, could, I could see a situation where 
uh, situation recognition can be trained. Yeah, that too. Right? Sure. Okay. They're, they're blitzing a pick and roll using computer vision. What is the play? Okay. Knowing where my other shooters are. Okay. What do I have to do against this pick and roll knowing they're going to blitz? Okay. And so pattern recognition in terms of defenses and maybe end of game situation, you know, whatever it is, you could see using computer vision to hone that and be able to recognize patterns quicker, which, which will help a player. I guess I think in terms of like development of like here's a player in a situation we're going to have a drill like what is the goal of this drill what is the basketball question we're trying to answer how are we going to measure it how does the you know how do we build up from like the action of like him doing it on air versus him doing it with like kind of a coach versus him doing it in a should say he or she because we do this for the Mystics as well um, doing it in a in a practice game situation versus in an actual game situation like each of those like you know building blocks scaffolding steps you're thinking about exactly what you're trying to measure, exactly what you're trying to teach. Um, why are you doing this? Why does it matter? Are you able to convey that to the player? Um, I, like it just, it, it starts compounding immediately. And I just think of like pitching is just so simple comparatively. And the pitcher is in control of yes. his own situation, right? Yes. But you know, you mentioned free throws. I mean, obviously there are only so many hours in the day. Guys have, and <laughs> men and women have, have um, lots of parts of their game to train, but like, is there an excuse for someone like not being an 80% free throw shooter? Like it seems like there would be huge value in like being able to tweak your own mechanics and study that and like get to the line and get 1.6 points yes, per possession. Yes and no. Again, it's, it's a matter of time. All right, if I had 10 minutes, would I rather spend it on 10 extra, 10 extra minutes of finishing or 10 more minutes of three point shooting versus three, like three throws are such a small, but you're not going to. You're taking 15 exactly. threes and not going to the exactly. rim anymore. So you can no, take I mean, all the free throws you want. Shooter, but like, even if I was a great three, three throw shooter, I wouldn't have scored that many more points per game because I was such a low volume guy. And the guys who do, and the girls, ladies who, who who shoot a lot of free throws, like, are usually above average three throw shooters because they get those reps and and it's just part of their game, right? So if I shoot 15 three throws a game, I find a rhythm. You know, it's hard to find a a, a really poor high volume free throw shooter across the board. There are exceptions, obviously. It's, I mean, it's also the case that when you do have one of those guys, it gets noticed and talked about a yes. lot. And yeah. it isn't like those people aren't focused on that. If right. you talk to Shaq about a free throw shooting, like he's like, I've had this conversation 50 times yeah. already. It's, not, uh, it's, again, not, it's, it's yeah. not like that problem's being ignored for the people in that corner of the graph where it's high volume but low percentage. But again, the rate at which they draw fouls is more important than their actual free throw rate, I would argue. Right. Okay, uh, to, to get a bit existential here, Shane, um, at what point in your NBA career did you feel like you were the player who you would become? Like, I, what, I want to, what I really want to flick out here is, like, is player development worth it? When, like, how much can a player really improve using data? All of these That's marginal gains question. are great, but, like, you know, at, at, how much can they really do? See, what makes you a great athlete at the level all right, WNBA, NBA is an irrational confidence in yourself, okay? You always think you can do more. You always, you never want to place limitations on yourself saying, well, I'm only a three and D player, right? I can, I can run some pick and roll. All right, you can post me up. I, I can do that stuff. And so um, that's what keeps you going, right? And so I realized that it's okay just being a three-point shooter and a guy who never dribbled probably in my second or third year into Houston. I played with, with Tracy and with Yao, and I realized I was never gonna ever run a pick and roll in Houston, ever, right? Because why would we? We want the ball in Yao and Tracy's hands and they need me to knock down threes. And so I think a lot of it's situational, um, but I would say about six, seven years in, you finally have the confidence to say, you know what? I am who I am and that's, that's okay. And that's okay. But as a young player, that's very, very, very difficult to, to accept. You know? And we see a bunch of uh, folks coming in from either Europe or, or the G League. Um, they have a different mentality. They usually come into the league, not, not as scorers. We're not, we're not going to the G League to, to get 20-point game scores. Those, those players are already in the NBA, right? So you're a specialist if you're coming from into the side door of the NBA, right? And so uh, the folks who are undrafted who sort of stick know what butters their bread 
and they really, really focus on that. And then maybe you can expand your game a little bit. Yeah, I think Alex Caruso told a great story yeah. about that on JJ Reddick's podcast, where yeah. Sam Presti, you know, spoke to him when he was in the G League and said, you know, you're if you're if, if I'm interviewing you for a job, like I don't need you to be the CEO. I need you to be like the plumber, and I need you to be an amazing plumber. But like that is yeah. where like that is how you're going to find a role in the NBA. Which brings me to um, Mike. Not about the plumber thing, but you know, of, of, of like a very simple way to think about it, players in the NBA. Very simple is like role players and star players, right? And the Celtics happen to have a lot of both. I mean, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are stars. Derek White is a classic role player. He's a glue guy. And I'm curious about Eastern Conference Player of the Month. Derek White. Yeah, he's he's great. <laughs> but yeah. weak month. It's really good. Maybe maybe weak. Yeah. Might have been weak. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'm curious about like how he's better than most role players. How those like two like breeds of players can use data to help their development. Like is it is it harder to go from an undrafted player to a good role player, a, a, like a, 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 a highly drafted player to a star player? Like are the, are the mechanisms different? Is one more dependent on good data, better data than the other? Um, I think the best players are all trying to get really good all the time. And um, almost everyone in the NBA is one of the best players. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's really a difference there. I will say the best players that we've had on the Celtics over my time there have all been people who wanted to add something every year, even when they were older. And um, I don't. I don't, you know, the, the more sort of distinctly defined your role is as a role player, and I'm, like I said, I'm not sure I'd include Derek White in that bucket, but the more distinctly defined your role is, the less you're going to have the opportunity to express something new in the game during the upcoming season if you're thinking over the summer about what to work on. Yep. Um, but the best players who have the ball in their hands a lot, particularly, um, or, or the best, you know, the guys who are going to defend the best players, those guys have to be prepared to do a lot more different things. And so it's easier for them to find something new and add it than it would have been for Shane, whose job was going to mostly be to stand in the corner, shoot threes, and defend the other team's best player. And so it, it's not so much that there's different data that those people might use, but they're just going to have more opportunity to express something new if they develop it. And so why not develop it then? Whereas the other guys, are, if, if, uh, if a guy who's you know, your field goal kicker wants to learn to throw a football, it's not going to be very useful. He's right. still just going to come in and kick field goals. But a corner three Maybe there's shooter. a fake. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I would add. Analogy breaks down. The, the players that break out and create huge value for themselves, think of a guy like Chris Middleton, right? Made himself into an, an all-star player. You, you have to have two variables present. You have to have an extreme amount of athleticism, length, Okay, that's a huge differentiator. <laughs> Middleton's six eight, can handle. He's he's pretty gifted that way. And you have to have opportunity. Yeah. All right. When you have the opportunity to expand your game, you become more confident, and one begets the other. You become a better player. When I was a rookie, all right, I was I was a power forward at Duke. All right, but I shot a ton of threes, so I was kind of a stretch four in college. Well, I got drafted as a small forward for the for the Memphis Grizzlies. Our third game into the season, our, our starting, starting two guard, Michael Dickerson, goes down with a sports hernia. Okay? Painful injury. Dumped for the, dumped for the season. So our, we we're not a very good team. We we're pretty bad. So, so uh, Sidney Lowe's like, Shane, you're our new two guard. So I go from guarding power forwards a year ago to all of a sudden I'm guarding Iverson, Ray Allen, Ginobili, you know, Kobe, and trying to figure it out. And so, that opportunity, though, was the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned how to survive against those guys. And once I learned how to survive, okay, now how do I thrive? And so, not that I was like super athletic, but I had the opportunity to learn, to make mistakes, to fail, and grow as a player. And so, for those players that make that jump, whether it's a role player and or a, a star, you have to have a, a really good level of athleticism or, or raw physical skills and the opportunity. This is a particularly hard problem for a team like ours for the coaching staff right now. We need to make sure that the guys who aren't playing are getting better. Mm. And, you know, there's 82 games. We probably practice twice in the month of January. Um, now, those guys are doing a lot more in the gym, um, yeah. you know, and, and 
when I say we practice twice in January, that means full team practices. The guys who aren't playing are playing all the time in the gym and working on all sorts of skills. But it's, it's hard. You gotta, those guys have to stay motivated. Um, you know, th those guys have to figure out what will get them on the court. And it may not be this year. And that's just really, really difficult for a young guy who wants to get better. I, I think one of the, the things that, like, I don't know, people in my position sort of struggle with or one of the, like, ultimate questions we're trying to answer is what's the difference between who a player is and what they're asked to do? Right, and I mean this literally example story right there. And if you can understand who a player is, and then like try to put them into a different situation, I can think of good examples. I don't want to mention players by name because I don't want to get fined for tampering. Um, but there are there are there are key examples of players who like in one on one team had a specific role, and then they went to a different team and they had a very different role, and all of a sudden they look great. And it's like, well, that player didn't necessarily change anything about his game, or if he did, it's it's on the margins. Like Mike's saying, like these are all the best, best of the best of the best of the best of the best. The changes that they're going to make are always going to be kind of like relatively marginal. It's always like who they were. It's identifying what their strengths are and putting them in an opportunity to like have those strengths thrive. Yeah. And I think for the younger players, like we're not really sure. And so that's why like a lot of times that development is just like actually figuring out like, oh, this is what Jordan Goodwin's really good at. And then we can, you know, convert. Sometimes him. we'll go looking for a player with a skill that, that doesn't get used a lot on their existing team, but would get used a lot on our team. How do you find that? Like, how do you go looking for we that? We have data skill? for that. Yeah. We're tracking data. And again, it's, it's, it's as much as we're able to disentangle who this player is, like on another team, if you're going to trade or sign in free agency, of like who they are versus what they've been asked to do. And like, what are the schemes that they've been in? It's like, oh, again, their three-point percentage has gone down. Well, that's because they're in this like weird situation. If we brought them here and they were just open in the corner, we expect it would be great. Um, Kathy, I want, before you worked for the Wizards, you worked for the Raptors. And um, Nick Nurse tells this really fascinating story in his book about Kyle Lowry going through a shooting slump mm -hmm. during the season they won a championship, the team analyzing the data from practice shots, seeing that his arc had dropped from like 46, 47 degrees to 41 degrees in the gym. So they knew exactly what they had to correct from the practice data, and then they did in the game. And I'm curious, like, how often does something like that happen in the NBA these days? I can't speak to the NBA as a whole. <laughs> um, also, but in your experience, I, yeah, is yeah, that yeah. like? There, there are definitely times where like, we will be looking at the data, especially you know, in the practice gym, and we'll see sort of like you know, trends of things happening. And uh, again, it's not that I'm going to go to the player and say like, hey, it looks like your arc is dropping. I might you know, text you know, the coach and say like, hey, it looks like, insert name of player here's, Arc is dropping a little bit. Also, probably talk to the medical staff. Like, is this a compensation thing? Is there something that's going on? Like, is he dealing like an ankle injury, and so therefore, like, he isn't able to get as much like push into the floor, and that's why there isn't as much elevation. Um, Opposite direction thing will happen too, where a guy's coming back from an injury, and you want to see him get back to where he was before. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and are are players receptive to that sort of feedback? Like, if they say I'm like my my percentages in a game haven't changed. I'm I've I've played like you know, but you're seeing something in practice data that hasn't manifested itself in a game yet. I mean, I don't talk to the players, <laughs> so I, I I couldn't tell you how receptive they are. No, no, do not tell me about my shot arc. <laughs> really? No, no. But if we but if we tell you like, hey, we want you to like <clears throat> take your knees out of the shot. Uh, no. <laughs> I want to be clear when I go into a game, and I want to play with my routine. And Even for you, like you, you yeah. used it, you understood, and oh, used no. it did better. A player, a player will, you know, it's like a golf swing. All right, a player is always adjusting. All right, the shot on day one is not the same shot on game 82. All right, you're always making micro adjustments. All right, but I know my shot better than anybody else. So then, so then if, we're, if, if, if as a like, player development staff, you're trying to affect a change in a player, yep. how much is it like we want you to talk to that player and say, like, this is a skill we want you to learn how to do better versus we're just going to have a bunch of drills. Yeah. And hopefully, as a result of those drills, that skill is going to yeah. get better. And you're not really going to know that it happens until all of a sudden your arc's I, I would be open. I'd be open to that. Yeah. You got have good coaches, right? Like, yeah, exactly. You have a good coach who can exactly. convince you to make a change in the way you're operating. Yeah. That's good like, like, Maybe it's not even about convincing it. It's just you're going to run a bunch of drills that are going to teach this skill that's going to incentivize that, like, oh, it turns out that like kicking the ball ahead so really it, helps yeah, us score more. Convincing happens a bunch of different yeah. ways. I'm thinking about, you know, again, it's like a golf swing. You know, great. the best golf swings, you just let it go, all right? The best shooting is you catch and you shoot and you let it go. If I'm thinking about launch angles, like that is like Ideally a game, that's all much. Just... No, well, ideally, yeah. Yeah. You know, so the more, about the, again, like, the like dedicated practice it's, sessions. It's, like what is the goal? Chip Anglin did something it, the more, with you, right? Again, like, 
Less is more. Once the game starts, I should not be thinking about anything but sure. game plan. But we're talking about like you know practice, like shoot arounds, practice sessions, yeah. like you know between games. Like in in the finals, there are two days off in between games, and no, it, in the finals, no. I'm I'm thinking about point, yeah. you know, da dance with the person you brought, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. By the time by the time teams gets to the finals, it's like yeah. Oh God. Hopefully, we're not tweaking people's shots now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although well, I did in before Game Seven of the NBA Finals, I did. I was missing. This is okay. Hold on a second. You just said don't like don't talk to me about my shot, and you're saying before Game Seven of the Finals, you are thinking about the mechanics of your shot. Swear, this is. I will go down saying this. Yeah, because I realized. But everything you just told us violates yeah, but that. I had to figure that out. Okay. So it's different when you figure something out for yourself, right? So the way you change your mindset is you, you, you're presented data, you think about how it affects you, and you make a decision how, how you want it to change, okay? Now, if I had someone, if Chip England, who had the credibility with me, came up to me and said, Shane, you're missing everything left, I'd say, okay, why? Because I had developed that credibility and that relationship with him. He had been with me my entire career, and so he knew who I was, right? Versus um, even like a coach, Chip was probably the only person I would ever listen to about my shot because he was there every day. He wasn't popping in and saying, hey, Shane, your, your shot's flat. All right, see you in two months. I'm like, get out of here, right? Would you like it if someone came in for, you know, and said, hey, Ben, your use of, uh, you know, your, your conjugation of this verb is, is horrible. Yeah, it's called right, an editor. Yeah, no, yes. yeah, exactly, right? And then they leave you alone. No, if you're there every day, you, uh, that's the personal side of it. And so... I figured out on my, on my own, like, it was just coming off my hand funky. It just happens. And I was missing left, you know? So I aimed right. But this, and, this goes back it. to Kathy's point. You yeah. need to have someone in between who understands both the exactly. data and yeah. the human yeah, side of the coaching exactly. process. Exactly. And just to be clear, this, this is when you were in Miami and Chip happened to be working for the San Antonio Spurs mm -hmm. on the other yeah, how, how ironic is that? Okay. He didn't tell me my shot was busted, right. by the way. I, I had to he figure out. He said, your out. shot looks great. Keep shooting yeah. the way you are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we have, we have um, about seven and a half minutes left, so I want to go to some of these um, very smart audience questions. Um, Shane, this is an interesting question. Um, it seems that most of the data development in basketball is focused on offensive improvement. And no. so what is the data right now behind individual player defensive improvement? Or maybe I should just let these two guys shaking yeah. their heads first go. Please. I mean. I, I don't Have you been asked that on every panel I, since 2007? No, no, but I don't think that most of the data development in basketball has been focused on offense. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Disagree yeah, with I dis the I disagree with the, the premise. Question. So you think it's on defense? No, I think we spend a lot of time on both of those Everything. things. Everything. Yeah. yeah. Is, it easier to, <laughs> is it easier to improve offensively than defensively, do you think? I mean, this sort of goes back a little bit to what, what Sue and Brad were talking about yesterday, uh, that you know, you can control what's happening on offense so much more than you can control what's happening on defense. And so we spend a lot more time talking about offense. Uh, Shane thinks that only offensive things are important in the game. But no, he no, doesn't. I know, famous, I know uh, from the I way mean, he played I mean, that that's not true. I'm just making funny. Data. I, I think but, it's uh, actually it's more true. actionable uh, game by game on the defensive end than it is we, offensively. We, offensively, it's more applicable, generally speaking. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you need to, certainly in the playoffs, we spend so much time thinking about what the other team's going to do and how we can counter it. And so, um, you know, I don't know if you count that as defensive data or not. Now, the question is a little bit more focused on individual defense, but individual defense is a lot uh, team defense these days. The defenses, from the time you were playing to now, the defenses are so much more complicated now than they were then. Yeah. Um, and the rotations have to happen so much quicker. Um, the floor is spaced so much more. So we spend an inordinate amount of time on guys' defense. What counts as individual, you know, you may think of individual defense just as what happens in an ISO. Right. But you're playing defense individually the whole time on a possession, and, and you need to know where to be, and we spend a ton of time on that. Um, you Kathy, no, 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 yeah. Kathy you've, I've, I've, heard, I've heard you speak about um, computer power and processing um, getting faster and cheaper. And I'm curious, this is an interesting question. What, what do you wish you had real time in games and how would that alter decisions on the floor? I mean, that's, that's, that's not a thing. I'm not trying to be in Coach Wes's ear in the middle of a game. Like that's, oof. I, like it, this is the thing of like, once it's game day, like just let him, just let him go. Like we're, we're trying to set everybody up to succeed and then 
you know, at a certain point, you don't want to like overthink things. Now, Mike might have a different answer, but for us, it's like in-game stuff. Like we're we're not particularly concerned right now about having stuff live. Hmm. I went to Doc once, and I said, like, there's a bunch of stuff we think you might want to have at halftime. And he proceeded to recite to me every play that had happened the whole first half <laughs> of the game. Yeah. Um, coaches get really good at this stuff. And um, that doesn't mean there isn't information that they want at halftime. Ooh, but whether you, or not they should but, challenge. But, like, really, really complicated processing yeah. doesn't need to happen. Yeah. Look, can you say that again? So wh whether or not you should challenge, which is, like, if we, if we could immediately have the, like, spatial data and know, like, yes, it was a goaltend or something like that, I suppose that would be very useful. I guess that's potentially like a three-point That's just going to get automated like anyway. I mean, yeah, sure, right? And that might just get automated anyway. But How like, does that work now? In the NFL, there are people in the booth who, you know, are in the ear of a coach saying challenge that. It seems like in the NBA, people are turning around and looking at people on an iPad. Is that right? We got a guy behind the bench, Matt. Mm. You, they, you actually should go back and watch the video of our challenge two games ago against Cleveland. Like, the whole bench was cheering for Matt because he, he, saw, he saw the way that Donovan grabbed Marcus's arm before they both flopped. And so, and so in theory, like, uh, if you it didn't was, have somebody was, who had eyes on it, it the camera, have, well, you know, the spatial tracking will have eyes on it even if it's on the other side of the court. And so like you would know that. Even the pose data we have, though, wouldn't have the detail that this video needed to have. But maybe one day. Someday, maybe. Yeah. What percent of Matt's job is figuring out when Joe should use a challenge? Not a large percent. But it's a very important part. And so is he, he's watching the game on an iPad like this, or when a big um, call happens? I, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly. He's got a computer behind the bench. Yeah. But I, I can't tell you what's on the screen. I know the things he's thinking about. We've worked with, with him to figure you out. Train, when, like that, you've, you've, there's there's like been some time thinking about, yeah. about when one should challenge and when oh, yeah. one should not challenge. Yes. Um, here's another Celtics question. This person is curious to know if Luke Cornett's closeout works analytically. Uh -huh. Not enough data uh -huh. yet. Sample size is very small. And we need the pose data. What's that? You need Porzingis the... is doing it now, right? I, I wonder why. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, I think that answered our question, right? Um, well, and the pose data, you'll be able to um, have a better sense. Better sense. Because, because, yeah, because right Luke, now, if you're, if you're theory, to look at it, it's Luke's like theory is he's, he's far enough away from the guy that he's not going to be able to block the shot. But if he, he's so tall, he can actually block the view of the rim if he yeah. jumps from 15 feet away. And so, so with the uh, pose day, we'd be able to tell, like, okay, his how high is where he the getting? player's head is, and like, are you actually blocking the rim? Like, we could get to that, sure. So when are you getting the pose data? Next season. Next like season. And so I assume this is the very first question that you're going to try to answer. Yes. <laughs> high on the list. Yeah. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, is there, is there, is there, um, maybe for Kathy or Mike or Shane, is 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 there any data that um, that could that could help predict and improve player development that you don't have yet that, that you would love? Like if you, Kathy? We can read their minds so you could understand decision making. No, you don't, you don't want to read our minds. That's coming the year after. You do not want to know what's going on in it's our like, minds. It's like evaluating decision making is a really interesting question. And it's like, it's a thing that's very, very hard to measure. So like, I would love to know like, you know, what, what was going through the Have mind. you done anything to try to like improve decision making? We have, we have, we have tried to find ways to measure decision making things. And the, the, the issue there is like whatever the, the choice that was made, like whether it was a pass or it was a dribble or whatever it is, like the counterfactual outcome of what choice they didn't make is like, it's How would you measure it? Baseball like teams have gotten very specific about this with the go, no go decision on a swing. And they're looking very, very carefully at players' decision making. They video game it. They do a yeah. bunch of training exercises. So much, our sport's just so much more complicated yeah. than their sport's really hard. Kathy, but you, th you think about measurement more than anyone in the league, I think. I think you lead, like, how, how would you try to measure that if you could? I mean, like, ideally, you would be able to have a duplicate world. <laughs> In each one, so you're you know, an alternate when, universe. when Brad gets a pass, in one of those worlds, he puts the ball on the floor. In one of those worlds, he passes it to somebody else. In one of those worlds, he shoots it. And then we do this thousands and thousands of times. And then we can determine, like, what was the correct decision there? And did he make it? I mean, and, and so, so, the, so, the, okay, so the observational version of this is to try to get large sample sizes, to try to understand, like, in the times when that pass was made, what were the points, you know, scored? What were the expected points? What was the quality of the shot? Like, if there's an open person in the corner, how much would we expect that shot to then be projecting out however much further because he's not going to be open by the time the pass gets there. They're going to close in, right? It's this, it's this counterfactual prediction into the future. And so, like, yes, we have, we have done a little bit of that, um, but the data is, you know, like, again, it's, it's not perfect there's, there's, and we don't 
know what they're doing. Selection bias issues yes. there too, right? There's strong selection bias issues there. I want I want players to randomize what they do in every possession for several seasons. Well, the little bit of that sounds fascinating. We, we're out of time. I want to ask Mike. One last question. We started this 16 years ago in 2007. Oh. So let's end it 16 years from now in 2039. You are still on this panel. Why? Because you're always <laughs> on this panel. What, 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 do you, what do you expect um, the annoying moderator like me to be asking you about in 2039? Uh, are we taking too many threes? That was a 2008 question. I what, what, uh, what will things look like 16 years from now? <laughs> Those are the questions Mike, that will be Mike, Mike, Mike. Load management. Uh, load management. That'll be a question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, that's, that seems like, you know, not talking about load management seems like the right place to stop for these guys. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It was a pleasure. Thanks to everyone on this panel.